Let us go live. All right. I think that says we're live. Welcome, everybody, to another Wine Shark Wednesday. I'm going to wine cork this back up. And it's another fine Wednesday afternoon. Yours truly running around like a crazy person. It's been a weird April, all I have to say. Sorry about missing last week. Life, taxes, literally all the kind of crazy things. Uh, hello to Donna. Says she's saying hello there in the chat. Welcome to the show. Like I said, sorry we missed you. But um, yeah, we're having kind of an overcasty, cloudy day. We've gotten some fun things done. Showing off new stuff. Check it out. Wine Shark merch. Uh, for those of you that want to support the channel, you guys can go over to wineshark.com and on the shop section. You can get cool stuff like hats and shirts and uh, even got a fun new shirt for my show at the Scarborough Renaissance Festival. So, I should have put that in the images here so that you guys could see that. But anyway, so yeah, um, lots of things in, in process and motion. Got my Clinker Brick uh, subscription today, so hooray Wine Club Wines. A couple of Albarinos, a Dolcetto, and a Garnacha. Uh, let me know if you guys are interested in me doing any sort of uh, coverage from those wines. Those are examples, once again, though, of wines that you're generally not going to see at the grocery store. Those are going to be club style wines. So, kind of, uh, you know, different than my usual modus operandi. Um, normally, I like to talk to you guys about wines that are fairly easy for you guys to get a hold of and really kind of meet you where you drink, so to speak. But um, it's always fun to try new things and especially to get off the beaten path. If you're at that point in your wine journey and are interested, let me know, and I can put some content together for those types of things. So, um, yeah, but uh, we're doing that. Scarborough Renaissance Festival, well underway. Uh, we're doing Wines of Germany this upcoming week, so if you guys are up to the mood to join us down there in Finn's Pleasure Palace, we've got a lot going on down there. But today's topic, we are going to talk about uh, expanding your grape varietal knowledge. Um, just a little brief overview. I'm um, kind of doing these top five kind of things, doing some some internet typical stuff, but I wanted to kind of uh, hit some topics at this very high level because of the questions that I get a lot from you, my YouTube guests, uh, my Patreons, and of course my real world and live and in-person customers. So it's always amazing to me um, when I introduce new grapes or to somebody because while well, I tend to think of them as something I've tried many times or a year over the years, I realize that's actually part more of my profession and my passion for wine. So you may not have been exposed to some of these wines. Some of you may have heard of, some of you may have never tried. Several of them are not really what I would call obscure, but you definitely have to go out of the way to find them. And none of them, I think, are examples that you're gonna find at the grocery store level. So this is definitely a piece of wine knowledge for you to take to a wine specialty store or a big box store or go online and search out if any of them sound tasty and delicious. You. Now, the grocery store grab today, we're going to do this Murphy Good. This, of course, is still from the grocery store. So we're keeping you in line with that, you know, we're keeping in line with that kind of thing. But um, let's talk about grape varieties real quick. Um, so these five grapes have kind of come to my, my fun attention. They're favorites of mine. Um, not only have I been speaking about them recently, which got my attention back on them, but also some of the grapes that I really think that people um, can, can benefit from when they go outside the standard box. When I say the standard box, you know, I'm not, you're talking about your, your Chardonnays, your Pinot Noirs, your Cabernet Sauvignon, Merlot, Syrah. You know, those are the big, popular, very well selling grapes across the world. Malbec is now in that category. Used to be an obscure grape from Southwest France or a blending wine from a uh, blending grape in Bordeaux. Now it's got its whole Argentinian back club and a whole bunch of, uh, of uh, backers on its own. So it kind of has gotten into its 15 minutes of fame and popularity. Uh, the wines that I'm talking about here, I don't think any of them really have. Uh, most of them are fairly niche, grown in fairly small places in the world, go to specific types of wine, or just really haven't gained a lot of popularity yet. So, without further ado, grape number one, the Garganega. So, this is a case where the grape is not what you're going to see on the label. It's an old world style from the, uh, the Veneto in northeast Italy. Uh, most commonly used in a grape called Soave from the DOC Soave. Uh, you might see it in Soave or Soave Classico. Those are the DOC rules or Denominación de Origine Controlada, the rules for how you have to grow and cultivate and make your wine, right? They preserve that sense of place and they uh, preserve that quality level. 
Well, Garganega is a nice dry, it produces a lot of dry wines with these floral, um, peach, and very light to medium acidity wines um, that balance very well off their fruit. Um, when I was, I have some recent examples that I've tried were really this beautiful middle of the tongue, mid palate light wine that is a perfect food partner. So go out and check out Suave. Garganeg is not generally grown in other places, so it really kind of fits this one niche, but they are not hard wines to find. Um, most any good Italian wine, Italian restaurant with a reasonable wine list, it better have a Suave or two. In fact, I fell in love with it um, when I first started waiting tables at a little Italian restaurant called Caparelli's, and the Bola Suave was an early introduction to my wine world to what Italian white wine could be like, because my experience up to then, of course, had been strictly into the Chianti world. And uh, it was a great experience. It's a wonderful food wine, especially with linguine and clams. So go check it out. Garganega, that's your first grape. Next, we've got Verdejo. Right? Verdejo is from the Rueda region of Spain. Like I think the stats I looked up are something like 98 point something percent of it is all grown in Spain. Uh, so this is a very strictly Spanish grape. It's from the Rueda, which is west of Madrid. If you look at Madrid as being basically kind of the center of Spain, it's on the west towards the Portuguese border. Uh, this type of wine, this is another wine that, uh, grape rather, that produces dry wines. Um, these are another very light style, um, similar to uh, Garganega. Um, it's got this lime zest, kind of grassy herbs, uh, and more stone fruits like apricot or peach as its, um, as its aromatic profile. Um, very light in body, very easy to drink, very good for uh, hot weather and food friendliness. And generally speaking, Verdejo is one of those wines that, you know, um, when you're, looked up, you're looking up at, at Wine Folly, I remember reading about this. You know, they talk about wine. The, the Verdejo Appreciation Guide is, is a fairly uh, small club of people. Not many people ever get to this wine. It's not the first or even the second wine you try. Um, it's kind of an obscure Spanish white. Now, again, not wildly hard to find, but you will have to look probably at a specialty store to go find Verdejo, okay? the little green one. Uh, next, we're also going to talk about a wine, a, another grape that is from Spain and also Portugal this time, and that's Alvarino. Now, this one I would say is probably the most popular of the five that I've chosen. I see this one around at restaurants more now than I used to, um, but this is a Spanish and Portuguese variety grown uh, uh, all the way up at the top of what they call the, the green part of Spain, the north, very northwestern tip, or what we would, I, I jokingly refer to as Portugal's hat from Spain, Asturias Baixas area. Right there and then down into Portugal, they use Albariño to make light white grapes. Uh, well, white wines, rather. I keep getting grapes and wines confused. I'm sorry about that. Uh, anyway, dry wines, again, this is another dry style, um, which, by the way, side note and asterisk, I get a lot of guests that are always asking about sweet wine styles, that many people come to their wine experience beginning with sweet wines. And unfortunately, that's not a big category in the over, most of the world's wines are dry. So unfortunately, when it comes to I like sweet stuff, you have narrower choices. But this is another dry style. Um, this one has uh, more citrus and citronella, uh, the orange blossom, lemon, apricot kind of tones. This is one of the, uh, the wines in the aromatic white category that have these those terpenes we've talked about in some of my classes. Um, terpenes have that specific um, floral note, and this, this one has that orange blossom or citronella action really as its kind of primary note. Um, very bright acids, very light body, really fun wine from Spain and Portugal. You should really go try this. This one, like I said, is probably the easiest to get of the first three, um, or at least I know. I see it around more here in, our, in my local area, so maybe it's more popular here. But uh, Hello to Mark. Says Betty's back home in Texas, and Mark's at home. Well, where'd you go? And, oh, well, Willamette Valley, Oregon. Excellent. Well, we had some uh, Willamette Valleys with my Wines of the Americas this last week and really enjoyed some Pinot Gris, uh, one of the famous uh, trio of Pinots from Oregon. Uh, so glad to hear you're back. I'd love to hear about your experiences up there and know where you guys visited. Okay, so those are three white grapes. Let's talk about two red grapes. Um, next day, or black grapes, technically. Um, we're going to talk about Blau Frankish, um, a German wine weekend is coming, and this grape always kind of pops under the edge of my radar. Um, not a wine that I've had very often. I've only had maybe two or three examples of this in my time, so not grossly familiar with a ton of it, but the ones that I've had, I have quite enjoyed. They're very different. 
Uh, Blood Frankish grows across Central Europe. This grape, compared to the other three so far, is the widest in scope. It grows across Central Europe and in many other places across the world, um, though it comes under a variety of different names. For instance, in the U.S., we call it Lemberger. Uh, but this is a late-ripening, highly tannic grape with a dist distinctively spicy note. When we say spicy, don't think piquant like hot, spicy, jalapeno, peppers, hot sauce. Think more along the lines of spicy in the terms of baking spices. Um, things like allspice, uh, white pepper, um, cardamom, uh, what else am I thinking through here? Ginger, you know, that kind of thing. Okay, so this, make, this again is a, is, a, is, a late, is a big tannic grape. Um, so it makes dry wines that really accelerate their dark cherry, uh, baking spice lines, um, kind of get this blueberry pie thing going on because it's got this reductive kind of flavor to it, um, not meant in the, in the pejorative sense. Uh, and the very excellent acidity, one of the things that Blaufarnkisch does that kind of shocks people, uh, kind of comes out of the, the left field, is that it is a very high acid grape, similar to Barbera or Gamay. Okay, it has this nice high acid profile that makes it very juicy and mouthwatering. It's very different for its weight compared to most of the other styles of grapes that run in that category. High tannic grapes like, say, you know, they, what we think of in the Cabernet, Mer Cabernet Merlot, Cab Franc kind of categories, the typical big Bordeaux blends, those high tannin wines, while having that baking spice profile, tend to have much lower overall acidity. So this is an example where the acidity comes back, making it a very fun wine for food purposes, or even just on its own. It is a very interesting grape. And you can get it from a lot of different places, which means you can get it from a lot of different styles. Um, the last one I had tried was from Steel, which was a U.S. version, although they still called it Blau Frankisch, not Limburger, from Lake County AVA. And it was very light. In fact, even I would say lighter and brighter than their Pinot Noir. It had much more of a gamay-like character, very light, easy drinking. That baking spice, blueberry, blackberry line was very strong, and uh, I really enjoyed it. So, easy drinking red, check out Blau Frankisch. Uh, next up and finally, uh, one that is dear, near and dear to my heart, and that is Tanat. T-A-N-N-A-T. -N -N and Tanat uh, is originally from the uh, Sud-Ouest uh, Appellation de Origion Contrôlée in France. Okay, so southwest corner, basically south of Bordeaux, towards the Pyrenees Mountains of Spain. And uh, this is now popular as an as a easy-to-find variety from Uruguay in South America. Um, they, the, the, the new wine countries, which is an odd thing to say, new world, of course, applies to anything that's not in Europe, right? We think about the new world as, you know, South America, North America, South Africa, New Zealand, Australia. Well, places in the new world that were under colonization especially under the Catholics, had, have had grape growing for 500 years. But they haven't had a wine industry that has necessarily gone that long. They weren't making wine for the purpose of export. Those are fairly young, and that's where the wines of Chile, Argentina, and, and Uruguay have these newer sort of wine industries. And each one of them has kind of latched onto a particular style of grape to find kind of the founding of its popularity. This is where that Malbec in Argentina is so very popular because it's the one thing that they've been really pushing. They make a lot of other types of grapes down there, but Malbec has kind of made their thing. Well, the thing in Uruguay is Tanat. And um, the French versions are these big, dark, tannic reds that have all this dark plum and currant and flinty flavors and smokiness. They are the high, on, high end of the scale of deep, dark wine. Um, the Uruguayan versions tend to be just underneath that. They're a little bit more black cherry, blackberry, rather than dark plum and currant. But um, they also have a little less tannin to them, a little more tame. But they are a delight to drink. That, and they often blend them with Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon to make some really big, bold wines that are delightful. And uh, if you're into the big, dark end of the pool, Tanat is definitely where you want to go. So, those are your five. Garganega, Verdejo, Arino. Blau Frankish, and of course, Tanat. So check those out. Um, if you've had some of those, go ahead and uh, type some comments down there and below so they can let me know what you think. If any of these are your favorites so far or you've never tried them, let me know. So we'll take a break. One more for them. Wet my whistle. And let's get into our wine quiz brought to us by Wine Wars. All right. So our Wine Wars categories, once again. 
Categories are Vine to Vino, which is about growing grapes, making wine, and wine production. Then we've got the Grapesphere, which is about the grape types, the wines that they're made from, and their geography, where they come from in the world. Last is Wine Cellar, selecting, storing, and tasting wine, wine and food, my personal favorite, and then Cork Culture, which is about people, business, arts, sciences, and more. So kind of like a trivial pursuit, but for wine. So here we go. Let's see if we can stump the chump. We'll also make sure I read the right side of the card again this time. So, number one, true or false? To make white wine, grapes are pressed before fermentation. This seems like a trick question. To make white wine, grapes are pressed before fermentation. Because the answer is that kind of depends. But generally speaking, broadly so, grapes, all grapes are crushed before fermentation. Unless you're doing malolactic fermentation and some other obscure, older style style stuff like Georgian style winemaking, generally we press before ferment. So I'm going to say true. Okay, it says true. It just seemed like so bold on its face that it seemed, it seemed almost like a trick question. So ding, 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 that is true. Um, yes, you can make grapes, wine from grapes without crushing using some natural crush methods. As I said, carbonic maceration is one. And Georgian winemaking method. I'm going to have to look up what the, uh, what the tanks are called that they use and the method that they call it. So, so Betty says that those on, on the chat, Betty says they've had a Tanat from Virginia and Texas. Really? That's interesting. And Virginian wines is something I've been desperate to get into my North American show. Um, I was really surprised, by the way. My, as a side note, my distributor didn't have any wines that I could get from uh, New York State this time. All of the Texas wines they had were not ones that I would endorse, and I still can't get a hold of any good wines from Mexico, of which there are some fun ones that I want to try. So, um, sad that the fact that Virginia is not on my list either. Again, I've heard that Virginia, because of their um, wine production and levels versus their consumption, they mainly sell inside the state. They have very, they have very little stuff left for export because they consume all that they drink or drink all that they make which is, well, pretty darn cool if you ask me. But all right, so second question, true or false? Merlots from Washington State are likely to have a fruitier style than Merlots from California. I'm going to have you go ahead and say this is true. Uh, Washington State being a slightly cooler growing condition because of its latitude. The Walla Walla Valley, while dry, does produce lighter styles of wine. And Merlot has been pretty much Washington State's jam. They kind of actually kicked off the thing before California got a hold of it in the early 2000s and turned it into the wildly raging, crazy portion of Merlot that we had for a while. Well, this says false. Washing Merlots are likely to be balanced with crisp acidity. Well, that would explain its cool, gro cool growing climate, but I don't know that I would say that they're less fruity. But hey, eh, one wrong for me. True or false? Well, we got a lot of true or false on this one. True or false? European classification systems of quality control are a reliable guarantee of wine quality. Well, they ought to be, since the idea is they're supposed to rank up as a pyramid, generally speaking from broad table wines to uh, what VDQS, the Vendée de Qualité de Superior, which is basically, uh, or IGT, Indicazione Geografica Tipica. These are broad wines that are typical of an area. Then we get to the, the mid-tier, which are the, the base tier in most, which is uh, AOC in France, AVA in America, DOC in, in, in uh, Italy. That's supposed to be your quality level of barometer. And then you have the subgroups within that, like the DOCG, the Denominazione Origin Controllata e Garantita, or even um, Chateau level wines and, and the smaller production areas uh, within an AOC. So let's say uh, Saint Joseph inside the, Rhone, and then inside the Northern Rhone or, um, actually that's not a good example because it's an AOC of its own. Better example would be, let's say, um, Moulin Avant, you know, in Gamay. It's a sub-region of Beaujolais that's a specific commune. And those are supposed to relate to quality. So I'm gonna go ahead and say true. Now they apparently don't like the Europeans because they say fall. This is a helpful guide, but not a guarantee. It's possible for a poorly made wine to meet the rules within a classification. I say BS. That's another one that I'm gonna disagree with, but and apparently I got that one wrong too. Because the whole point for the quality control is to guarantee the quality. Otherwise, it's not very useful. Yes, the rules are there, but I think the idea there would be you're not guaranteed it at a price point, but meh, whatever. I disagree with the wine war. True or false? 
The convention of a smaller wine, white wine glass serves no compelling function, making a red wine glass suitable for double duty. Technically false, but practically true. So I'm going to go ahead and say false because I bet that's what they're going to say. Well, yeah, they say true. The answer is false. The, the idea that aromas are captured in there is something that is both made by the glass makers and, of course, it's functional from wine. But any wine glass will do at a pinch. That's the practical. But on the traditional... The idea that you're more, you're with wines that are lighter, you're trying to reduce the space the aromas have to float around it. You're basically concentrating them. So with wines like sparkling wines, rosés, and white wines, you want that smaller glass to help concentrate that aroma. And I don't care what wine war says, they're wrong. All right, man, that's three and one. I'm doing awful today for my score, but. Last but not least, what wine titled song written and recorded by Neil Diamond was released in 1983 by UB40? I'm going to assume that's Red Red Wine, because that's the only UB40 song that I know. And well, hey, at least I got that one for pop culture alone. So two out of five today, ladies and gentlemen. Not my hottest show. But a lot of these true false questions I think are too broad. I mean, the idea of fruitiness and the idea of quality, whether it's quality or not. I don't think that those are very good examples that they're using there. And if I was to, to teach you in a class, I would teach you to have a little bit more broad mind than that because they're trying to put some real absolutes like, well, you can't be guaranteed quality. Well, of course, nobody guarantees quality. That literally doesn't exist. Nobody's going to put a thing on a bottle of wine that says, if you buy this and don't like it, we'll just give you your money back. So I say, bah. Bah, I say. All right. Well, then last but never least on today's show, we have the grocery store grab. The grocery store grab, for those of you that are not familiar, is the premise of getting the best value per dollar for, at, for buying wine out at non-specialty and non-big box retailers. If out of convenience you shop at the grocery store or out of necessity, um, it is not a good place to get a lot of good wine help. So we like to learn about how we'd read wine labels and reward wines that have good quality labels to give us good results. Um, sometimes it's fine to buy a water bottle just because you like the way it looks, but what's on that bottle should be able to tell us a lot about what we're about to taste. So we like that. Here we go. We have got, uh, we've got Murphy Good is today's old grocery store grab wine. Let me show you here on, on the uh, images tab here. This is what our wine looks like. Um, this is a very popular brand. I got asked if I had this before the other day. I had to say no. Heard of it. Never never tried it. So figured that this was now was the time. Um, easily, widely available wine. Uh, Pinot Noir from California. So this is a broad spectrum Pinot Noir. Right? Notice it doesn't say that it's from any area of California. So this could be, you know, anywhere from the Central Coast all the way up uh, to the North Coast. Generally speaking, most of the Pinot Noirs are grown on the coast just for a... Uh, cool weather's sake. But Murphy Good, here's on the front. Here on the back, it says, though Pinot Noir is unfailingly charismatic in the glass, it can be a finicky devil out in the vineyard. This is very true, by the way. Uh, only revealing its nuanced texture and brilliant flavors in very specific growing areas. We select fruit from these perfect pockets where Pinot develops vibrant fruit character, bright acidity, and that plush, earthy underbelly that makes the wine so alluring and, alluring and appealing. Then it's got a broad band here that says tasting notes of raspberry, cherry, and tea leaves. Okay, so what we like to look for here is we're looking for who made the wine? Okay, Murphy Good. Where is it from? California. Although specifics are good and generally indicate a wine that's going to be more toned in. They explain on their label on the back there that they are selecting from various areas. This is mostly a winemaking technique that helps get the best bang for your buck, right? You're leasing and buying grapes from all over the place rather than one place, which puts you, A, less subject to the weather, and B, you can basically uh, pick and choose where your grapes are coming from. Well, it doesn't give you a prestige. It can give you a really good product. But I love that tasting note band. It's basically this reverse type on the back that's got, you know, a, black, a nice, the, the, the dark blue of the front label, it's basically reversed with white text. It says, tasting notes of raspberry, cherry, and tea leaves. That is great because it gives us common wine words or common flavor words that we, we should be able to understand about what we're supposed to taste. Okay, that is a key thing. Now, it doesn't have any uh, wine pairing there notes or tasting notes uh, for that on there, but that's all right. Um, they're still not yet embracing... Um, uh, uh, what do we call it? Call it augmented reality there. So that whole idea, the uh, 
The entire uh, idea of using a, a QR code or something else to give you more information, they're not there yet. But, oh, oh over here in the chat, Mark saying, Betty also said that she's had Albarino from Miramar, from Russian Bear River. Yep. Yeah, I mean, 100%. Albarino is certainly not a, a, a Spanish and Portuguese wine only. We make Albarino in Texas. Albarino is, is, gets around a little bit more. The, the least ones that you saw on the list is Garganega really isn't grown anywhere else, and Verdejo really isn't grown anywhere else. The other three, you can find examples most anywhere in the world. And I'd, I'd certainly love to see what the uh, Russian River uh, varietals are like. Nice, cool growing area in California. Those would be very tasty. So, very cool tradition. And, uh, yeah, that Spanish wine growing tradition has traveled far and wide. All right, so let's see what this tastes like here. This is... Uh, Color-wise, um, this is a iconic uh, Pinot Noir. It's got uh, basically a nice, clear cranberry color. Um, you, I can actually look directly through my light here, which is great. It's got really high contrast. Uh, but it's got a nice, dark cranberry color and is very, very clear, very see-through. That's kind of typical of uh, most Pinot Noirs. You're not going to have that really deep, dark, extracted color that you can't see through. So that indicates good, it has a good indicator. On the nose, it really jumps out with that cherry tone. I mean, this spells California Pinot Noir to my nose right off the bat. And there's a little bit of that tea. I, I definitely get that. Um, there's a there's a dark note to it, a, a musty note. Um, not quite as good. I wouldn't go so far as to say earthy, but I like that tea leaves is a really good way to describe that because it brings a an herbaceousness, that dried thing to it. It's, it's something that's not fruit fruit flavored. Um, and it's really kind of in the back, top back of your nose. Really cool. Um, very good descriptor of theirs. Um, and that's not one that I see that's very common on, on, wine on wine labels, and it should be. Also, by the way, a source of tannins. So, all right, let's go ahead and take a sip. Okay. Um, really well balanced on the grip. Tannins are not over-presenting. It's now into that bright cherry, definitely raspberry, although I want to say like a, almost a dried raspberry or fruit leather raspberry. It's not a, not a fresh raspberry. It doesn't quite have that same acidity, although the wine's got good acid balance. It does make your mouth water. A um, little bit warm. Um, that 13.9% alcohol is kind of at the front, although I think my wine's a little warm, so I might, oh, I might uh, point that towards uh, service temperature. That If I chill this down just, just right, I think this is warmed up to about my ambient temperature here of almost 70 degrees, 75 degrees. So it's a little bit warm. It needs to be dropped about 10, 10 degrees. And I think that would knock that alcohol out. But yeah, bright red fruit right across the middle. Really well balanced tannin. Not much else to it, though. There's not a lot of layers of complexity. But then again, this is a $13 bottle of Pinot Noir. I'm not expecting a big, Burgund a big Burgundian flavor bomb here. Right, I'm not even aiming at things in you know, in <laughs> to reference the, the Russian River or Los Caneros or uh, Santa Rita Highlands or Santa, uh, Santa Rita Hills or Santa Lucia Highlands. Some of those specific places that Pinot Noir comes from in California, I think I have a little bit more depth of character. But that also comes with the higher prestige level of mono, uh, mono, a, mono AVA wines at the least, or if if not estate level wines where all the grapes are grown in one place. Because this is kind of a, a traveler, a little bit of a little bit of a wanderer, uh, this has got a little bit more broad character. It doesn't have that specifics. It doesn't have, pardon me, doesn't have that complexity. But still, not a bad little drink. Definitely would try again. So uh, I generally ready. Is it well executed? Yeah, this is a kind of a do no harm. It's not, it's not doing anything. It's not broken, right? Uh, is it is it on style? Uh, yeah, this is squarely in the lighter California camp. I would say this is. Uh, one where you can expect to see uh, this kind of thing at the sub twenty dollar level in Pinot Noir from California, very well in that square in, in that category. Is it worth the price tag? Yeah, I'd say again, especially for being as broad a level as it is. I'm sure this is a big mass market wine, and they're you know they're they're not they're not putting putting their their ever loving handcrafted best into this. But is is it a reliable reliable source of reasonable juice? Absolutely. Um, I think this is one that you would definitely want to try and check out if you find it in the grocery store. So enjoy that. And uh, see what, I want to see what else Murphy Good has got to go. I'm pretty sure, like I said, they're in this. Uh, they're, a, they're a Santa Rosa-based outfit, uh, according to the label. That is where their offices are, at least. Um, but remember that 
where you're, where they are on the label doesn't necessarily mean where the wines were made and or where the grapes were grown. They were kind of vague there about uh, where the grapes were grown because they had to. So. All right, any last questions before I sign off for tonight? Um, go out, try some of those grapes. Ask those questions down in the comments after the show. If you like what you see, share and hit that like button and share with a wine-loving friend. Um, support us over on Patreon. Man, I'm way still way behind on supporting some of my Patreon stuff. I've got so much stuff to do. In fact, because of the way things are, I'm probably going to restructure things over there entirely and uh, really kind of scope in exactly what it is that I can do over there and, and separate out some of the, the the heavy video content that I've been trying to do just isn't working for me. So. We're going to lighten that back up and focus mostly on wine selections and food selections to go with it. Uh, that way I can keep up with the content, keep my promises, and make sure that there's interesting stuff over there. Uh, after feedback from some of the, from my Patreons, and make sure that you guys are getting some, something worth and make sure that you're only paying for the value you need. So, Anyway, if you guys are interested, support me over there. Links are in the description. Go get yourself some Wine Shark merchandise over at WineShark.com. And last but not least, Enjoy what you drink, and I hope to see you guys here again. Until next time, I have been your wine shark. Cheers. The funny part is I don't have anything to eat with this Pinot Noir right now. That's going to make dinner awkward. Now I got to hold, shift my whole evening food to match my wine. But that's just the kind of wine shark I am. So, cheers, everybody.